For 10 straight years now, the Jackbox team has released a new party pack in mid-October. It's an annual tradition I really look forward to, and I think they've had some really great offerings in recent years. As with the last few packs, this one offers a single sequel in the form of TKO2, pretty fun to say, which is this year's drawing-based game. And there are four new titles, including a trivia game, Time Jinx, some text editing nonsense with Fixie Text, their first ever rhythm based game with Dodo Re Mi, and the hidden identity role playing game Hypnotorious. Some important notes right at the top this is the first price hike for one of these packs in five years, costing $5 more than the last few at $35 US dollars. It's also potentially the the buggiest party pack I've played, which came as a real surprise 10 packs in. So with that higher price tag and more performance issues than usual, it's only achieved a mixed rating on Steam, and seemingly isn't selling very well. In past videos, I've quickly described how you play Jackbox games, but the analytics show that you guys just skip past that anyways, so if you're uncertain how to play this remotely, you can just go check out the official how-tos from Jackbox, I'll link those down in the description. For the last few years, I've also rated how well these packs stream. They continue to add streamer-friendly options, although how functional they are is rather hit and miss. And honestly, after some pretty negative experiences in the past, I had no interest in subjecting myself to the unpredictability and often insufferably unfunny aspect of playing with strangers who are trying to derail your game. I find I only really enjoy these games when I'm playing with people I know. So streamers beware, let's get into the individual game summaries and reviews. TKO2, made for 3-8 to eight players. If you've watched my past Jackbox reviews, thank you, but you'll know I'm not a huge fan of TKO. I'm also well aware I'm in the minority there, so I went into this one with an open mind. The beginning of the game is much the same as the original TKO. Everyone draws three pictures, then submits slogans until everyone has entered at least four. These pictures and words are then shuffled together and randomly distributed to the players, then matching together a drawing and slogan and submitting that for combat. If you're stuck on what to draw, you can ask the game for a silly prompt, which was very helpful, and the drawing options were overall more robust, with both a pen and highlighter to draw with, allowing for two thicknesses and two layers of drawing. There's also a proper eraser, which isn't always true in Jackbox games. You can choose to present on a shirt, tank top, or sweatshirt, and there are several font options to mess around with for your slogan. I just wish you had more freedom over the placement of things. Your oddball mashups are then submitted for all players to witness. The reason I disliked the original TKO is that the gauntlet style voting meant there was always a recency bias, as the impact of that first shirt shown slowly wears off. This is much improved by instead putting the shirts through a bracket of voting. That was my main gripe with the game before, as the jokes inevitably got stale, so I thought this was a huge improvement. Although I do find it weird that you can vote for your own shirt, as there's never really a reason why you wouldn't do that, unless you just want to admit that you don't deserve the win. That just felt a little strange to me. In round two, unused pictures and slogans are redistributed. You have the option to either draw an entirely new picture or to edit one someone else submitted, which actually opened up some really funny opportunities. Plus, you get to dump even more slogans into the pool. You go through another bracket of shirts leading into the final round. Here, the two previous winners go head to head, with the winner being decided in a tap off. This wasn't fun in bracketeering, and it isn't fun again now. Maybe they could have played around more with editing other players' shirts, setting it up so that everyone gets to choose one of the two previous winners, and then submitting their own corrupted takes on it, playing up the idea of a cheap knockoff shirt. Then they could have awarded points to people for submitting slogans and art, rather than it simply being this bracket towards the top. That would have made things notably longer, and I think one thing this has going for it is how they quickened up the pace and kept things relatively short. So I'm just spitballing ideas here, the only thing I truly dislike is that final round, otherwise it's funny and very functional. 
And same as before, if you really wish for some reason, you can buy physical copies of any of the shirts you made during that session. Back in the day, I gave the original TKO a 5 out of 10. With the updated drawing and presentation options and the bracket style voting, I found this one to be a vast improvement. While I think there's more they could have done with it, as it is, it's a pretty solid 8 out of 10. It's up for debate whether they changed enough from the original game, but as someone who didn't like the original, I found this to be much better. Time Jinx, made for 1-8 to eight players. This year's trivia offering. I'm honestly surprised how many ways the Jackbox team has managed to put unique spins on trivia year after year. This one is presented by the new host, Jerry Rig. Although this host is more of a narrator than anything else, honestly hosts in general have been really downplayed across this pack. The gameplay reminds me slightly of Gaspionage, in that players are trying to get as close as possible to the correct year something happened. Your score is a measure of how many cumulative years off you were from the correct answer. So the lower the score, the better. In your standard rounds, there will be three questions. First offering a time range of only 15 years, then 30, then 60. So that allowable range of guessing is doubling each round. When two players guess the exact same year, it is a jinx. But this has absolutely zero impact on the actual game. I don't even know why they bother drawing attention to it. I think jinxed players should have been given the option to either double down or change their answer. They literally put it in the game's title, and it still doesn't matter, it's just very strange. After three questions, you will participate in one of three special rounds. In Time Hop, you are given the decade and a question. You then have to select the correct answer. So <laughs> it's regular trivia, but it tells you the year it happened. In Time Loop, you must answer a number-based trivia question, and after everyone has submitted an answer, the game will give you some stats, like how many players got it right, or nobody selected option D, then giving everyone the chance to change their answers. And in Time Fix, you are presented a fact with the incorrect component highlighted. You then need to select the correct answer. So in a roundabout way, this is just fill-in-the-blank trivia. They really play up the time travel element of these, but they're all just fairly regular trivia. Time Loop was probably the most interesting, having a second chance at your answer, but even that felt half-baked. What I do like is the scoring system here. In each special round, you answer a handful of questions, and for each correct answer, you reduce your total score by 10%, which is a great catch-up mechanic. Later in the game, it will also pass simple secret hints to the last place players, like, this year ends in a 4. So if you haven't been doing so hot, you have a slightly better chance of getting one bang on. There is another special type of scenario that will play out during your game, where you either answer a question about a historical figure, simply selecting the correct answer, or you are given a famous landmark. The landmark in question has been replaced with something odd, and you must select the correct location without seeing the landmark. For either of those two bonus rounds, guessing correctly earns a 20% point reduction. You'll go through a series of three questions and then a special round again, and for the final round, it just asks you to pick a year plus an arbitrary number because it's the future. But really, it's just asking you to guess a year again. After you do some quick math, it's the same as the previous rounds. However, in this one, the closer you were to correct, the greater your point reduction. I quite liked this game. Mostly, I give it credit for that unique point scoring as it really does balance things out fairly well. It feels good to be rewarded just for being in the ballpark, rather than outright knowing the specific answer every time, as trivia so often demands. The game is short, which is nice, because there isn't actually a lot of variety. I think the special rounds felt a little undercooked, as the time travel concept was never fully realized, but it's not a bad trivia game. Probably around a 7.5 out of 10. Fixie Text for 3 to 8 players. This is a team based writing game. When it opens, everyone votes on whether they'd like to have a text conversation that is themed as either flirty, serious, business, friends and family, or unknown number. This determines what the opening text will be that you as a group are crafting a response to. 
the game presents the text you have received and generates a starting reply. Only one team plays at a time, and when the game says go, everyone can start adding to that reply from any location in the text they wish. However, there are no backspaces or delete keys. Everything you type is permanent, and it's worth noting each player has a limited character count available to type things out. Once that is over, a text-to-voice robot will read your incomprehensible nonsense out loud. Listen to your heart. It will tell you all you need. Harold, eat my boo. Take a hint and listen up on me will never happen no matter how many times let's we cannot. This is illegal. Please kiss me deeply. This is illegal. No, kiss me. No, leave me alone. <laughs> and the other team votes on their favorite words, with the option to cast multiple votes on a single word. Whoever wrote that word gets points, and if multiple writers contributed to it, as often happens, including the many typos across the board, they both get points. You then do the same thing again with the teams reversing roles, and you go through that whole process, each team getting a turn one more time. Really what this game is? is opening a blank Google Doc page and laughing at the insanity you all type out. There is no incentive to stay on topic or to write anything that makes sense. And in fact, the weirder you get with it, the more likely you are to have your standout word selected. We had each other in hysterics, but that's just because we find each other funny. There was nothing curated like in Quiplash or Job Job to steer the direction of the game. We played a few rounds and had some decent laughs. I love the visual styling of this game, and we generally enjoyed our time with it, but it is hardly a game. There is no difference whatsoever between the different rounds, and we found this to be the buggiest game in the pack. Nearly every round we had the sad realization that several players either had the majority or the entirety of what they contributed removed from the game. It would be showing up on your phone the whole time, and then the final version the game presents was missing most of what was typed. And because of that, a few people simply couldn't win because they had no words to vote for, which completely killed our buzz. So while we had some big laughs messing around with it, the lack of structure and egregious bugs earn it a 3 out of 10? There is very nearly something here, but it's it's kind of a hot mess. Dodo Re Mi for 1 to 9 players. Jackbox creates its first rhythm game and its first live gameplay since my much despised Zeepel Dome. Having people play a live game remotely across numerous devices like this just simply didn't work back in the day. And I have to give them credit here, they vastly improved on that issue. There is a synchronization prompt right at the top that ensures both the gameplay and end result are properly synchronized. It's actually pretty impressive how well that seems to work, so kudos there. The gameplay is really similar to Guitar Hero, or if you remember the mobile game Tap Tap Revolution. A few instruments play a little differently, like the kazoo requires you to slide around rather than tap. This is being played for a giant flower monster, and if you do well enough you are spared, if not, you are eaten. The better you perform individually with perfect timing and streaks achieved, the more points you earn. You can play any number of songs before being given a grand total final score, and you're free to switch instruments and difficulties as you please. Although many of the songs are locked at first and are only available by playing the game more, which seemed a little unnecessary. These wacky renditions of classic songs are pretty hilarious on their own. I really like these silly little birds and the range of instruments such as constant screaming. However, you aren't really playing together. It's just a bunch of people quietly looking at their phone, tapping out inputs, and then sitting back while you watch the final performance. I play Jackbox games for the social aspect. Trying to make each other laugh, working together, discussing results, getting insights into each other's personalities. This is just a group of people separately playing a rhythm game that gets tied together at the end. And maybe some people will like that there's more of a gamey game in this pack. 
I've heard it said that while streaming, there's some nice quality of life features allowing players to very easily join and leave, or even hand off the hosting duties. But at the end of the day, I didn't like the fact that I didn't really feel like I was playing with anyone. How you perform doesn't really affect anyone else. Another nitpick, but I really dislike the time it spends introducing every single band member one by one. It was just kind of obnoxious. Looking over the Steam comments and reviews, people really like this game. I think it was executed as well as a Jackbox rhythm game could be, but it's only like a 6 out of 10 game for me. And finally, we have Hypnotorious made for 4 to 8 players. This might be the single worst tutorial Jackbox has ever given. This one is so poorly explained and leaves out key information until the second round where the tutorial suddenly continues. I'll do my best to explain it properly. This is a hidden identity role playing game. So first, let's look at the hidden identity aspect. The group will be split into three secret categories, each assigned a unique identity within that category. For instance, the category could be gardening, and the objects are things like watering can, a shed, and a rake. Each player knows their own object, not what anyone else is, or what the categories are. What the game doesn't tell you until later is that one player is the outlier, meaning that they are the only person belonging to their category, with everyone else grouped up into the remaining two. You can play with only four players, but it takes a minimum of five to properly be separated into two, two, and one outlier. With four players, three people are in a group, and there's one outlier which kind of trivializes identifying the person who doesn't fit. So I would say the actual minimum is five players. The fun part of this twist is that the player is not told that they are an outlier. So they're playing the game same as everyone else and trying to deduce which category they belong to. Next is the role playing element. You are asked a series of questions and are meant to answer them in character as your object. While the game isn't especially clear on this, you're not trying to be funny or to actually fool anyone. You're meant to answer these prompts in character, but in a somewhat roundabout way so that you're not outright telling anyone what you are. It's very unguided. After everyone's answers have been presented, you must sort yourselves into three bins, trying to group up with other objects you believe were in the same category as you. It can be rather fun trying to talk this out amongst the group, but it's not necessary and is kind of discouraged because you don't want to accidentally reveal what object or category you are. You earn points for correctly grouping up with others like you. And on your phones, you can look at players' previous answers to help you reflect on if that grouping still makes sense from one round to the next. After two rounds of this, we come to the accusation, where everyone votes on who they think the outlier was. But rather frustratingly, you cannot review answers in this round. So if you didn't memorize who was who in the previous rounds, which you wouldn't do on a first playthrough because the game left that out of the tutorial, you'll be going in blind here. If the majority identifies the outlier, anyone who guessed correctly gets points. If the group does not agree, the outlier gets the points. Which I found utterly stupid for two key reasons. First, since you don't know you're the outlier, then nothing is driving you to try and fool everyone else. Not not being accused has nothing to do with how well you played the game. And second, the outlier is told to select themselves if they think they are the outlier. However, by doing so, they are likely now contributing to the majority vote. They would get more points if they purposely threw their vote in an effort to stop a majority from being reached. At least I'm pretty sure they would. I've never seen a Jackbox game do such a poor job of explaining how you earn points and completely failing to give you updates on the current standings, so you're never really certain where you're at. This game is really missing some basic functionality. So the concept is somewhat interesting, but there are so many minor frustrations here that really dragged the experience down. 
There is so little gameplay at hand, there's next to no strategy, everything moves so slowly, and the scoring surrounding the outlier is a mess. The game only works if everyone stays as vague as possible, but there's nothing encouraging you to do that, and you would actually be rewarded for lying, then sorting yourself correctly, throwing an entire wrench into everything. And the game was yet again quite buggy. If things were better explained and sped up, with some tweaks to how the outlier is handled, maybe it would be good? Even with all these frustrations, at least it was generally functional and had a decent concept behind it. So while I'm the most riled up about this game, it was not my least favorite. I would give it like a 5 out of 10. I would maybe try it again someday. But it's never a good thing when you have to play a burner round for everyone to try and learn the mechanics before you can actually play properly. So let's take a rapid fire look at the full pack, the TLDW for everyone who jumped straight to this timestamp. I'm shocking even myself here by praising TKO2 as much as I have. It's more of the same, but generally better in my mind. In a similar vein, if you've never gotten bored of the original TKO, it's debatable whether this offers enough updates to justify an entire new pack. Time Jinx is a quality addition to their lengthy list of trivia games, and even if you don't know loads of actual trivia, you might still stand a chance with the well-handled catch-up mechanics. I just wish they made some of the time-traveling stuff that they hype up matter a little bit more. Fixie Text is barely a game. It can be funny, but it's always just gonna be a jumbled mess of word salad. And unless the bugs are fixed, I'll likely never play it again, because realizing that everything you just did got cut can completely killed the mood. Dodo Ray Me seems to be a crowd pleaser. I had fun playing as well, but no more fun than just downloading a rhythm game on my phone and playing it by myself. I'm not certain that any jack boxiness really shines through in this one. And Hypnotorious was more frustrating than anything else. Even once we got a grip of the game's needlessly obfuscated concept, some of the categories were then too obtuse to function properly. This is the first pack to have a mixed reception on Steam, and while quickly reading through those reviews, the impressions I got were that the majority of people agree TKO2 was a big step up. Overall, a very high quality game. People generally liked Dodo Ray Me way more than I did, so take my criticisms there with a pinch of salt. People didn't like Time Jinx quite as much as I did, people were pretty split on that, but it generally tipped positive. Hypnotorious was all over the place, I would say 50-50, people would either say it's the worst game Jackbox ever made, or it's okay. Nobody really seemed to love it. It seems like that one more than any other is really going to depend on who you're playing with and what sort of patience you have. And basically everyone agreed that Fixie Text is just a fancy Google Doc and not really a game. So back to my own thoughts here. End to end, every game felt fairly underdeveloped. Concepts are underexplored or not adequately gamified. Packs 6 through 9 all exist in my top 5 Jackbox games, so it pains me to say what an absolute disappointment this one was. I'd maybe place it somewhere in the middle, but considering the raised price, inconsistent quality, and abundance of bugs, I'm dropping it down a ways. The bottom of this ranking is still some of the earliest games, since they were still really figuring things out at that time. So it's at least better than those, but not by much. And knowing that this dev team isn't especially well known for patching their games, I'm not expecting it to improve as dramatically as it currently needs. It's the first time since Jackbox 4 that I would say you could pretty safely skip this pack. Even if they were to patch it up more than I'm expecting, it's pretty weak overall. If one or two of those games sounded decent to you, maybe pick it up when it's like 50% off. I won't go so far as to say it's the worst pack ever like some are saying, but if they're gonna raise the price and under deliver, I'm gonna judge it pretty harshly. What did you guys think of this pack? Am I way off the mark with my evaluations of these different games? Which were your favorite or least favorites? Or why? I'm still disappointed that they didn't do a pack of all sequels the way I theorized they might have. Hell, maybe that's how they'll win people back over with Jackbox 11. I still sincerely hope that this dev team can weather a very underperforming pack, but it does call into question what the future of this franchise will really be. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.